Today, I'm talking about Quirk and Michaelian's paper, Generative Memory. The basic idea of this paper is that memory doesn't necessarily work quite the way we think it does. We often might think the way that memory works is something like the way our closet drawers work. If I have a sweater that I wear in the winter and then I put away and store and then get it back out to wear the next winter, uh, the sweater doesn't undergo very many changes. I fold it maybe when I put it away, maybe I then wear it, wash it and put it back and fold it again. And, uh, uh, and we can think that the sweater works basically the same each time I wear it. However, the basic idea is that memory works a bit more like Lego storage. If I build a Lego castle, but I want to store it, I usually don't put the whole castle away. I'll take it apart and just store the pieces. And then later on, if I want it again, I'll have to put it back together. And if I have a whole lot of Legos in my house, I may not put all the pieces for the castle into that drawer. I may leave some of the common pieces out in case I need them for anything else while I'm uh, doing things in the intervening time. And when I reconstruct it, I may build it not quite exactly the same way that I had it before. And he's going to argue that this has some implications for how we think about knowledge. Um, and since Michaelian is a contemporary author, I'll put a link to his website in the description below. Uh, one other thing, here is a list of 16 words. Uh, you can pause now and memorize them. And a few minutes later, I'm going to ask you to recall them. And uh, uh, this will demonstrate some of the features of how memory works. OK. This paper explores the implications of the psychology of constructive memory for philosophical theories of the metaphysics of memory and for a central question in the epistemology of memory. So constructive memory is this idea that we don't store things fully intact. We store them and rebuild them as we recall them. And the metaphysics of memory here is about what is the actual state in the world that realizes these uh, memories? What is a memory? And then the epistemology of memory is these questions. Why are we justified in believing things that we think we remember? When, if at all, do memories actually count as knowledge? I first develop a general interpretation of the psychology of constructive memory. I then argue on the basis of this interpretation for an updated version of Martin and Deutscher's influential causal theory of memory. So Michaelian is going to investigate that particular theory of memory, argue that on the basis of some of the details of what we've learned about how memory works, we ought to uh, revise that theory and add a few extra conditions in order to understand what it takes for memory to create justification and knowledge. I conclude by sketching the implications of this updated theory for the question of memory status as a generative epistemic source. And generative here is going to mean that you can become justified in believing things through your memory that you were never actually believing before. Okay, there has been relatively little philosophical work in recent years on the metaphysics of memory, the nature of memory in general. This is presumably because most philosophers have assumed that something close to Martin and Deutscher's causal theory of memory is right. And he's going to give the details of this later. Bernecker's recent work, e.g. the first book-length work on the metaphysics of memory to appear in some years, defends the causal theory of memory very much in the spirit of Martin and Deutsch's. And there have been no very recent attacks on the theory. While I too ultimately want to defend a theory in the spirit of the classical causal theory, I also maintain that our confidence in the causal theory has been to a certain extent unfounded for the psychology of constructive memory poses a significant challenge to the causal theory of memory, and few philosophers concerned with the metaphysics of memory have so far taken empirical work on the constructive nature of memory into account. This paper, therefore, explores the implications of the psychology of constructive memory for the causal theory of memory. In section one, I develop a general interpretation of the psychology of constructive memory. In section two, I argue, on the basis of this interpretation, for an updated version of the causal theory of memory and compare the updated theory to existing attempts to take the constructive character of memory into account in the metaphysics of memory. I conclude in section three by sketching the implications of the updated theory for the question of memory status as a generative epistemic source.
Before proceeding, a note on the concepts of generation and preservation of beliefs and belief contents. The generation of new content occurs when memory produces content in addition to that which it took as input. This can occur either before retrieval by means of transformation of content received from other sources or at retrieval by means of transformation of content stored by memory. The generation of a new belief occurs at retrieval when the agent accepts a retrieved record that she did not previously accept. This can occur either when the agent's memory stored a content that she did not previously accept or when retrieval generates a new content. Memory is preservative of beliefs of, or contents if it is not generative. So that is, he's going to mention that there's the moment when you have some experience and store that experience, or perhaps when you learn a fact and store that fact. And then there's a time period when whatever that memory trace is, is stored in your mind. And then at some later point, when you remember something, this is uh, brought out. And he's going to say that sometimes what comes out is not exactly the same as what went in. Either what comes out has some additional content that was added to it at the time it came out, or was added to it at the time it was stored, or was added to it along the way, or it was transformed in some way along uh, this entire process. Uh, and if, it's, if that didn't happen, then we say that the memory is purely preservative. It's not generative. OK, section one, constructive memory and doxastic generation. Doxastic here is a word meaning uh, having to do with beliefs, as just as epistemic is a word meaning having to do with knowledge. Though it is a commonplace in psychology that memory is constructive, construction and its cognates, as they're used in the context of memory research, are difficult to define precisely. A precise definition is perhaps not possible at this point, but we can describe the various ways in which memory is constructive. Note that we should reject the obvious proposal that construction in memory is precisely a matter of content generation. The proposal is not implausible. Memory is, after all, called constructive in part because it is supplemental, because some of the changes that occur between the study and the test involve memory for information that was not contained in the input. We'll demonstrate this a little bit later. But to identify construction with content generation is, for reasons given below, to disregard too many of the phenomena usually regarded as exemplifying construction in memory. Though the proposal is to be rejected, it can be used to illustrate an important ambiguity in the concept of constructive memory. Content generation in memory can occur at either of two points. Content other than that provided by the initial representation might be incorporated into the memory trace before it is retrieved, and content other than that provided by the memory trace might be incorporated into the representation resulting from retrieval. That is, you can, there can be stuff stored that was additional to whatever you experienced or learned the first time, and there can be stuff pulled out other than what was stored. In order to eliminate this sort of ambiguity, Coriat, Goldsmith, and Pansky propose using construction to refer to relevant processes occurring at encoding and reconstruction to refer to relevant processes occurring at retrieval. For reasons given below, I will modify this usage slightly allowing construction to refer also to relevant processes, if there are any, occurring during consolidation. So consolidation is this period when the trace is just sitting there in the back of your mind, but it may not be just sitting there, it may be undergoing changes. I will continue to refer to memory in general as constructive. That is, he's going to use reconstructive for the specific thing that happens at retrieval and construction for any of these things. The ambiguity in talk of construction is familiar to psychologists. It is less familiar to philosophers. I emphasize it here primarily for dialectical reasons. That is just to make sure that you know how to follow the dialogue between him and various other authors writing on this topic. As long as we are in the grip of a picture on which a memory trace or engram is a faithful record of experience, we will be inclined to suppose that remembering must be a matter of retrieving the trace unaltered. But if we realize that the trace itself is constructed, 
it should begin to seem much less obvious that remembering should be a matter of retrieving it unaltered. If there is nothing lost by construction at one stage, there need be nothing lost by reconstruction at the other. If there is something gained by construction at one stage, there might also be something gained by reconstruction at the other. I take my general account of construction and reconstruction in memory from an influential paper by Alba and Hasher. And here in the footnote, Alba and Hasher discuss constructive and reconstructive processes in the context of schema theory. I'm not sure exactly what that is. And they object to schema theory on the ground that memory representations are richer and more detailed than the theory suggests. But even if we acknowledge that the particular theory criticized by Alba and Hasher over exaggerates the extent to which memory is schematic, their concepts of selection, abstraction, interpretation, integration, and reconstruction remain available. Their argument is not meant to show that there is no role for constructive and reconstructive processes in memory. Okay, so they uh, were arguing against one particular theory of how memory works. And for the philosophical purposes, it's going to turn out that it's not essential how human memory actually works. As he's going to discuss throughout the paper, there are a lot of interesting features of how our human memory works, but any sort of creature with memory may well undergo some of these sorts of processes if they have to live a life like ours. That is, if they're not just a computer sitting on a desk that needs to perfectly remember the things it's told and never remember anything else. Okay, so Alba and Hasher described four ways in which memory might be constructive. So here we'll see the first bit of how this works. Selection. Only certain incoming stimuli are selected for encoding. So note here, you don't remember every single thing you see. Only some of it ever gets it into your memory at all. Abstraction. The meaning of a message is abstracted from the syntactic and lexical features of the message. Here, think about what happens if someone tells you something and then someone else asks you, what did they say? you'll often repeat back something that means the same thing as what the person told you, but you probably won't repeat back precisely the same words and syntax and grammar. Uh, and that's because you don't bother even remembering precisely what words they used. You remember only the meaning. And to see the difference, imagine that someone told you something in a language that you only half understand. If you can recognize the sounds of the language, you may be able to repeat back precisely the words that were used because you didn't notice the meaning and therefore what you remember is the sounds and not the meaning. But abstraction is one thing that often happens when we remember what people say. Interpretation, relevant prior knowledge is invoked. And so this is when you fill in extra information beyond what was precisely given to you when you uh, store something because you already know some background information. We'll see some examples of that later. Integration. A holistic representation is formed from the products of the selection, abstraction, and interpretation processes. So that is all three of these phenomena are sometimes occurring together. And the thing that is actually stored is going to be some holistic thing. We don't know exactly how memories are stored in the brain, but it's presumably not with words written in any language. It'll be something that is selected, abstracted, and interpreted from your experiences and your learning. We can now see why it is a mistake to identify construction with content generation. Both selection and abstraction reduce the quantity of information incorporated into the n-gram. I believe n-gram is just the psychological term for whatever is this trace that is stored uh, when we store things. These things, these eliminate content. Interpretation, in contrast, makes additional content available. In integration, finally, the simplified content and the newly available content are incorporated into a single memory trace. Alba and Hasher characterize reconstruction in retrieval as follows. Reconstruction. Whatever information was selected for representation and is still accessible is used, together with general knowledge, roughly to generate a hypothesis about what might have happened. Uh, and so here they're saying, whatever you stored was only a partial record of what happened. And it's because you expect to know all sorts of background information at the time that you 
reconstructed that you're able to get something basically like the original. And this is like I was saying earlier, that if you take apart a Lego castle and store it, you may not store every single ordinary piece there. You might only store the special pieces that are needed for the castle and assume that you can reconstruct the castle using the ordinary pieces that you just have lying around in addition to the special pieces that were unique to that castle. Among the most interesting examples of reconstructive processes are meta memory processes, monitoring and control processes involved in retrieval. And here he's describing a few of these. In source monitoring, e.g. the source of a memory trace is inferred, perhaps automatically and unconsciously from certain features of the content, e.g. its level of detail. So that is, you often figure out, is this memory something that happened to me or something someone told me or something I read about in a book? And sometimes your memory specifically includes that information of how you got the information, but sometimes you just sort of work it out from the way that this uh, memory trace is encoded. And occasionally we get that wrong. Occasionally we seem to remember something as having happened to us, even though we, uh, it was actually only told to us by our sibling. In fluency processing, the source of a memory trace is inferred, again, perhaps automatically and unconsciously, from features of the retrieval process. Footnote two, I return to meta memory below in the context of a discussion of the means by which the reliability of constructive memory is secured. In general, constructive and reconstructive memory processes are processes in which information is actively transformed by the memory system. The constructive nature of encoding, especially selection and abstraction, is illustrated by the phenomenon of false recognition in which subjects who study a number of words related to a non-presented theme word, e.g. are la likely later to recognize the theme word. So here, remember those words that I gave you a few minutes ago? Here's six words. Some of these were in that list and some of them weren't. Can you remember which ones were and which ones weren't? Here, you probably got Arctic because that was a very distinctive word that was on that list. And you probably recognize that pineapple and flashlight were not on that list because those are again, distinctive words that weren't on the list. You probably got warm, correct, that it was on the list and that desk wasn't. But I predict that many of you thought that cold was on that list, but it wasn't actually. It turns out the list was 16 words that all had to do with the concept of cold, but cold itself was not on the list. And so if you thought you recognized cold as having been on the list, then this is an illustration of the phenomenon of false recognition, where you tried to memorize a list of 16 words, and part of what you were doing was noticing the meanings of those words and not entirely just paying attention to the specific sounds and letters and specific words that it was. Okay, fuzzy trace theory provides a plausible candidate explanation of this effect. According to the theory, both verbatim and gist traces are formed during encoding. That is, there are some traces that you store that have the words themselves and some traces that are just getting you the gist of what's going on here. Gist traces are more readily accessible and so tend to be preferred. It's a lot of work to memorize words verbatim. Hence, subjects are led falsely to recognize non-presented theme words because you think, cold must have been there, that fit with the gist of what I saw, even if it didn't fit with the verbatim trace, because my verbatim trace gets lost very easily. I don't put in enough effort to build that, but the gist trace is usually what I rely on, it's usually good enough, got it wrong in this case. Second, the phenomenon of boundary extension in which subjects remember having seen more of a scene than they saw, in fact, provides another revealing illustration of the constructive nature of encoding, especially interpretation. I'll put a link in the description below to a really nice paper on the topic of boundary extension. And even if you don't read the paper, I think it's worth flipping through just to look at the pictures. And you can see subjects were shown some photographs and then they were asked to draw what they saw. And then when they draw it, many of them draw a larger region than what they actually saw. They draw 
parts of the scene that they didn't actually see. And that's because our memory tends to fill in parts that it thought it just missed. According to one explanation of this effect, it is a consequence of the fact that information about the likely layout of the scene is automatically retrieved and then incorporated into the memory of the scene. That is, you look at this picture, you see a bucket, and you assume, I must have seen the whole bucket, so I draw a whole bucket. But actually, what you saw was only a cropped image of part of the bucket. A final illustration, especially of integration, is provided by the super portrait phenomena, in which caricatures are often recognized faster and more accurately than our faithful portraits. And think about that. If you look at political cartoons, it's probably easier to recognize politicians that you're not terribly familiar with if you see the political cartoon, where any distinctive feature that they have is drawn in an exaggerated way, rather than when you're just looking at a photograph of a bunch of people wearing the same boring suits in Washington, DC. According to Rhodes, this is likely the consequence of the fact that the relevant representations are, in a certain sense, highly schematic. They emphasize the distinctive properties of the things rec represented. That is, just as when you're storing a Lego castle, you may not keep the boring ordinary pieces, but might just keep the specially shaped pieces that are distinctive to the castle. When you're storing a memory of a person, you may just store the bits of that person that are unusual and then fill in the rest the way that you expect normal people to look, however your brain treats people as normally being. The list of examples of construction can be extended almost indefinitely. There are deep differences among the various types of construction, and there are interesting theoretical debates about how best to explain them. But there is no significant debate over whether encoding is constructive. Some of the construction occurring at encoding seems, moreover, to involve content generation. Consider again the phenomenon of boundary extension. It's not that the subject first forms a belief to the extent that the scene before her eyes appears to have such and such a layout, and then infers that the scene must extend in certain ways. Nor is it that the initial sensory representation already contains the extended boundary. The representation of the scene is modified automatically as a memory for the scene is formed. The modification process proceeds in stages. The early stages perhaps reflect the operation of perceptual schemas. The later stages apparently involve normalization in memory. And that is, some of this is probably happening when your visual system just automatically fills in things that it doesn't actually see. And then some of it happens later when your memory system fills in things that it just assumes were there and it might have forgotten. Some might argue that the fact that encoding in human memory is construction is of little significance to the philosophical theory of memory. Construction at encoding, they might suggest, merely reflects contingent features of the way in which memory is implemented in our species. The theory of memory thus need not take it into account, but should instead focus on what there is in common between constructive human memory and other non-constructive possible types of memory. That is, some philosophers say, my job isn't to understand the distinctive things of how humans work. My job is to understand what is it for a being to think in general. And if I'm thinking about memory, then what is it for memory to work? And if human memory has all these weird features, maybe that's not essential to the idea of memory. However, McKellian argues, while it might seem to us that we can easily imagine non-constructive forms of memory, it is unclear that these imaginings reflect anything more than a folk theory of memory. For it is probably not in the end a contingent feature of human memory that it is constructive. Consider, e.g., the case of memory for gist. In many cases, memory records not a literal representation of an experience, but rather its gist. Schachter and Addis suggest that extraction of gist is an adaptive feature of memory an economical way for a system with limited storage capacity to store the most important features of experience, the aspects of experience, knowledge of which is most likely to be useful to the organism again in the future. This kind of reasoning is widespread in the constructive memory literature. Constructive features of memory, features of memory that might appear to a philosopher's eyes to be mere peculiarities of the human memory system are, it is argued, in fact, adaptive. And now when they say adaptive, 
uh, he's saying things like, this would generally be a good thing for a creature with limited memory in a complex world to do. And therefore, we can assume that any creature that developed a memory system probably would have features something like this. Even if they don't do it quite the way that we do, uh, they might have a lot of similarities. And therefore, this, these sorts of features may be more central to the general idea of memory than you might think. And because you might have thought, this is just some weird psychological quirks of the accidents of evolution that happen to give rise to humans. There is thus good reason to think that construction at encoding is part of the real essence of memory. That in other words, it is not merely a contingent feature of certain memory systems. Footnote, this response to the worry that the constructive nature of encoding in human memory need not be taken into account by the philosophical theory of memory assumes, in addition to the view that declarative memory is a natural kind, certain standard but not uncontroversial views about natural kinds and necessity. Okay, declarative memory. This is memory of particular facts. This is often in, uh, contrasted with episodic memory, which is memory of events that have occurred uh, that, uh, to you. Uh, natural kinds, these are things that seem to have a nature in common and uh, that we often learn about by learning about their instances. And uh, philosophers often talk about some things being natural kinds and some things being artificial kinds. And so you might think that uh, uh, being made out of gold is a natural property because anything that's made out of gold has certain features in common, whereas uh, being a chair may not be a natural property because uh, each chair may be made in a totally different way. And you can't generalize about what chairs are like intrinsically on the basis of knowing that it's a chair. Uh, okay, so even those who reject the views in question should dismiss the word. Construction is a solution to the problem of finite storage capacity. We should thus suspect that all actual and most interesting possible creatures have constructive memories. Whatever we think about natural kinds and necessity, then we should be prepared to acknowledge that construction is an important feature of memory, one that ought to be taken into account by the philosophical theory of memory. Note that this does not imply that construction by itself is a complete solution to the problem of finite storage capacity. On the role of forgetting and solving the problem of finite storage capacity, see another paper by Michaelian. Okay, it is natural to suppose that even if construction occurs at encoding, a memory trace once formed will remain stable until retrieved, ignoring decay over time. You might suppose that, but in fact, a process of consolidation during which the memory trace is not yet fully stabilized, intervenes between encoding and permanent storage. If this process, which unfolds over a period of many years, is interrupted, the memory can be partly or entirely lost. There is reason to think that consolidation is no more a contingent feature of the human memory system than is constructive encoding. McClellan, McNaughton, and O'Reilly argue on the basis of connectionist modeling results Connectionist models are what computer scientists call neural nets, uh, and you can learn about them uh, through searching online. Uh, these, uh, they argue that consolidation is required in order to allow new memories to be incorporated without distorting existing memories. If the changes were made rapidly, they would interfere with the system of structured knowledge built up from prior experience with other related material. I think the idea is that your brain doesn't store a list of sentences in a database or a spreadsheet. It's rather storing everything somehow in this complex network of neurons. And the way that this storage works is that all the different things are somehow overlapping each other and stored in the same connection of neurons. And so you don't want to put new things in too quickly because you might accidentally change things in a way that erases some of what's already there. So they suggest that as, your, as stuff is getting into storage, it is gradually transformed to make it fit with everything else that you've got. And now here's a bit of the, um, the physiology, the neurophysiology of this. On their influential proposal, the hippocampus repeatedly replays episodes to the neocortex, allowing the neocortex gradually to discover their common structures. 
this can account for the categorization of memories and the formation of memories for what specific experiences have in common. If something like this view is right, the philosophical theory of memory should take consolidation into account, and it should take it into account as a constructive process, one in which, moreover, content, e.g. generalizations, is potentially generated. I think here the idea is that you don't necessarily remember something the first time it happens to you, but if it happens to you several times, then the features that were similar between all those occasions are going to get stored. And you might now get not just the memory that this happened to you a few times, but you might get a memory that claims something like this happens all the time. Note that even once consolidation is achieved, memory traces are not permanently stabilized. It's not just that reconstruction can occur during retrieval. It's rather that we must also acknowledge a process of reconsolidation. Memories become malleable when retrieved, and a period of reconsolidation is required before they can be said simply to be stored again. As Judai puts it, it's not the time since encoding that determines the susceptibility of a trace to interventions but rather the functional state of the trace. An active or retrieved trace can be truncated, but also augmented. An inactive or stored trace is immune to such manipulation. The transition from dispositional to occurrent and back, in other words, need not leave memory unchanged. So the idea here is that an occurrent belief or memory is something that you're currently thinking about. A dispositional one is one that is somewhere in the back of your head with the disposition to be recalled. You probably weren't thinking about Paris right now, but if I were to ask you what's the capital of France, you would have had the disposition to think of Paris. And so that illustrates the difference between those two. And uh, uh, you might be interested and or disturbed to learn about some of the work uh, that Elizabeth Loftus has done on how people's memories can be changed by giving them information at the time that they're recovering them. And she's used this to point out that all sorts of things involving eyewitness testimony are often really troubling, that often certain kinds of um, uh, investigations tend to make false memories in witnesses more than recovering the true memories. But a lot of this happens because of things that are going on at the time that you're actively trying to remember something. While it's just sitting in the back of your head, it doesn't get changed as much as at the time that you are actively trying to recall it and filling in the details. Memory, Schachter and Addis write, is not a literal reproduction of the past, but rather is a constructive process in which bits and pieces of information from various sources are pulled together. Just as perceptual illusions can be studied to reveal the normally invisible constructive workings of the perceptual system, memory distortions can be studied to reveal the normally invisible reconstructive workings of memory. So that is, by looking at perceptual illusions, you can do things to understand what goes on with the blind spots in your eye. If you stare at this one point and the objects on the sides of your vision disappear, then we understand how your brain is filling in the parts of the scene that it can't see because of where your nerves cut through your retina. Uh, and similarly, they want to see how do memories systematically differ from the original event to understand how the the brain is reconstructing and constructing the things that go into the memory. To this end, a wide range of memory distortions have been, investigate, have been investigated. False recognition arising from misleading post-event suggestions, e.g., might occur because thinking inaccurately about an event can create a representation of the event that cannot easily be distinguished from a representation of the actually witnessed event. So that is, if you saw something in a particular colored room, and then someone later asks you about it and asks about a whole bunch of different colors the room might have been, you might imagine each of those rooms, and then it becomes harder to tell which one was the real one and which ones were the imagined ones. Misleading retrieval cues can be incorporated into retrieved memories to produce false beliefs. For instance, when students with high GPAs overestimate their marks for classes for which they received low marks, that is, if you remember, I got a 3.8 that semester. Uh, you might forget that this was the class that you did worse on and the other classes were the ones you did better on. 
And it's because you're using good information. If you have a high GPA, then probably each class was high, but you might then forget that this one was the exception. Related phenomena include the retrospective bias and the knew it all along effect. In the former, recall is distorted to render memory consistent with present beliefs. That is, if you heard something at the time and then now you know something else, you may remember having heard the true thing now rather than remembering having heard the thing that turned out to be false. In the knew it all along effect, subjects adjust their memories of earlier probability estimates in light of their current knowledge of the occurrence or non-occurrence of the relevant events. That is, if it rained today, then you might forget that yesterday you thought it was going to be sunny today. You might remember yourself as having thought it was going to rain. Additional clues to the nature of reconstruction come from observations of various biases in spatial memory, e.g. Landmarks produce asymmetric distant, distance estimates, suggesting that spatial information is subject to a sort of interpretation according to the demands of the context of retrieval. That is, if you're trying to remember where your favorite restaurant was in some town that you haven't been to in a year or two, you might remember a few big landmarks in that town and think it was particularly close to one or particularly far from one because those landmarks stand out and all the neighborhoods in between that you didn't pay attention to don't stick out in your memory. Perhaps the most dramatic example of reconstruction is the phenomenon of confabulation. I've got a link in the description below to some discussion for mental health professionals about confabulation, but confabulation is something that we all do, in which subjects are led to recall entirely fictional events in great detail. You can very easily uh, uh, see examples of this phenomenon if you know a four-year-old or a five-year-old and you just ask them about whatever it is they're thinking about. They'll come up with explanations of all sorts for all sorts of things. And then we have the troubling uh, pattern of still doing that sometimes. And so uh, it's often hard to tell when you're really remembering something and when you're making up a memory of something. Merely imagining a fictional event increases the probability that the subject will later remember it as having occurred. The source monitoring framework developed primarily by Johnson and her colleagues provides plausible explanations of confabulation and other memory distortions. I discuss source monitoring in more detail below. For the moment, I point out only that a crucial element of the framework is the claim that retrieval involves reconstruction and in particular, that it involves content generating reconstruction. Nor is the source monitoring framework unique in this respect. Any account of retrieval, if it takes seriously the claim that memory distortions reveal the normal workings of memory, will grant that retrieval involves reconstruction and moreover, that it involves content generating reconstruction. When all goes well, there is a close match between the retrieved memory, including the newly generated content, and the initial representation. The content generation involved in retrieval is thus normally invisible. Thinking back to the Lego castle, if all goes well and I've stored the distinctive pieces of the castle in this box, but then when I reconstruct the castle, I'm just using a lot of other pieces that I just have lying around. If the other pieces I have lying around are the same type as I originally had when I uh, uh, made the castle the first time, the castle will probably end up being basically the same as it was the first time. However, if I made the castle last year and in the intervening year, I've changed which sorts of Legos are my default ones, then when I rebuild the castle, it may be substantially different because maybe I've got a whole new color of Lego piece or a whole new shape and size that I'm using. And, uh, and so it can sometimes uh, become more different. So, uh, under certain circumstances, when memory is distorted, the retrieved memory will fail to match the initial representation in virtue of incorporating inappropriate newly generated content. The point is that the same reconstructive processes are at work in both cases. Reconstruction in general and content generation in particular is not the exception, but the rule. 
Just as it would be a mistake to suppose that construction and encoding or consolidation is an idiosyncrasy of human memory, it would be a mistake, and for similar reasons, to suppose that reconstruction and retrieval is an idiosyncrasy of human memory. It is likely that the reconstructive nature of retrieval is an adaptive feature of memory. Recent work on episodic memory, that is memory of events that have happened to you, uh, tends to emphasize the involvement of the system in prospection, imagining the future. Schachter and Addis write, since the future is not an exact repetition of the past, simulation of future episodes may require a system that can draw on the past in a manner that flexibly extracts and recombines elements of previous experiences, a constructive rather than a reproductive system. If this line of research is on the right track, then we should expect reconstructive retrieval to be an essential feature of memory. That is, if you try to imagine what's going to happen in the future, you often take ideas you have, recombine them and fill them in in the sorts of ways you expect them to work. And if your brain is able to do that, then it would be very natural to say, rather than remember precisely what happened at some previous time, I just remember enough of the details that my reconstructive system, my imagining system, will probably fill the rest in correctly. And then the problem is, you can't always tell when you're looking at that recall, which parts were the distinctive parts that were stored and which parts are the ones that you filled in automatically. The acknowledgement that memory is constructive and reconstructive raises a question about how its reliability is ensured. Were memory simply to keep faithful records of experience, its reliability would be uninteresting. That is, if it worked the way that we normally think of a computer memory as working, as perfectly recording something and then perfectly reading off exactly the thing that it recorded, then there's nothing surprising about the fact that it would be reliable. It would be just as reliable as whatever process put it down. But given that memory is thoroughly reconstructive, its reliability requires some explanation. And here is a footnote. Memory distortions, again, are investigated not because memory is supposed to be unreliable, but rather because it is supposed to be reliable. Memory distortions are cases in which a process produces an inaccurate memory despite its reliability. That is, reliability doesn't have to be perfect reliability. To understand how reliable a system is, it's often helpful to look at the cases in which it gets something wrong to understand what's it doing in all the cases where it gets things right, and how is it able to be that reliable, despite the fact that it's possible for it to sometimes get things wrong. The complete story about the reliability of memory will cite memory, many different features of the system. But in order to illustrate the general structure of the explanation, I want to focus on source monitoring in particular. Footnote, note that Mitchell and Johnson motivate the source monitoring framework precisely by pointing out that memory distortions raise the question how the reliability of constructive memory is achieved. For additional discussion of monitoring, see Michaeli in 2010. It's crucial for the possibility of source monitoring, remember this is recognizing where you got the information that you remember, for the possibility of source monitoring, it is crucial that memory traces bear the marks of the origin. An origin in experience in particular is indicated by embeddedness in spatial and temporal context, embeddedness in supporting memories, knowledge, and beliefs, and the absence of consciousness of or memory for the cognitive operations producing the event or belief. So that is, if you wanna know how is it that uh, you can tell which of your memories are events that happened to you and which ones are events that you were told about. Uh, the ones that happened to you often have a bunch of distinctive features that, uh, that you, you're embedded in the surroundings as opposed to being outside the surroundings and seeing them. It is crucial for the possibility of the failure of source monitoring that the marks in question are not infallible indicators of origin. Because of variability within source types, the distributions of features of memories from different processes and events overlap, so that some memories originating in fantasies, e.g., might be more detailed than some memories originating in experience. So the idea is that if you spend some time imagining something in very great detail, then your memory trace may be very detailed. And when you remember something later, your brain often thinks, if it's this detailed, then it must have actually happened. 
And if it's just, just a sketchy thing, then it was probably something I just imagined. The consequences of these two features of memory traces is that attention to properties of a stored belief or content can provide a reliable indication of its origin, though not a perfectly reliable indication. Such attention thus can provide the basis for reliable predictions about the origins of beliefs and contents. The characteristics of mental experience cannot serve as a precise signature or tag that specifies its origin. Rather, remembering always involves judgments about how the quantity and quality of these characteristics compare to expectations about characteristics of memories from various sources. So, for example, if a mental experience had substantial perceptual detail, e.g. visual, one would tend to attribute it to a perceived event, e.g. something one saw, since on average, memories from perceived events contain quite a bit of perceptual detail. On the source monitoring framework, the reliability of memory is secured, not despite the reconstructive nature of retrieval, but in part because of it. Because they rely on reliable indicators of the origins of traces, reconstructive retrieval processes tend to come to the right conclusions about those origins. Because the indicators are imperfectly reliable, these inferences will sometimes go wrong. They can go wrong also if prior inferences involved in encoding went wrong. Such failures of source monitoring can account for many of the memory distortions reviewed above. In confabulation, for example, the retrieval mechanism misattributes a memory to experience on the basis of its level of detail. A reliable process produces an inaccurate result. The general story about the reliability of constructive memory follows the same pattern. Memory involves both construction and reconstruction. Content generation can occur at either point. This means that there is, in general, no literal record of experience. An initial representation is transformed first at encoding and perhaps also during consolidation. This already transformed representation is subject to additional transformations at retrieval. But these transformations are in no way arbitrary. They're designed to ensure that most of the beliefs eventually produced by retrieval are accurate. This is not all that they're designed to achieve, of course. The transformations are design designed also to ensure that the beliefs eventually produced by retrieval are useful. It is important to note that though monitoring is a form of meta memory, it is nonetheless a component of memory itself. It need not be that a subject first retrieves a content and then in a distinct cognitive act forms a judgment as to the source of the content. The formation of the judgment about the source of the content can itself be a step on the way to forming the belief ultimately retrieved from memory. Thus, monitoring can generate some of the content of the eventual memory belief. The subject stores content deriving from her experience, and then during retrieval generates additional content to the effect that the stored content derives from experience. The additional content is then combined with the stored content to form the content of the belief eventually formed by the retrieval process, a belief that the subject had an experience with a certain content. The content of the retrieved representation goes beyond the content originally stored, nor does the additional content derive from a simple inference from premises to conclusions. A retrieval process goes to work on a stored content and generates additional content. The additional content is then combined with the stored content. The belief finally produced is a belief with this combined content. And here, just think about the boundary extension phenomenon again. If you saw something that was most of a bucket and then you stored it as there was a bucket. And then later when you're retrieving it, you think you see bits and pieces of the memory. You realize I must have seen this. And you think, well, if I saw it, I would have seen the handle. And so you generate the handle. And now you have a memory content that says, I saw a bucket including its handle and you, you even have a memory content about what the handle looks like, but there was actually no edge of the handle there in the original image. That has been reconstructed. Section two, 
updating the causal theory of memory. Having described construction and reconstruction in memory, having clarified the relation of reconstruction to content generation, and having explained how the reliability of constructive memory is secured, we're now in a position to update the classical causal theory of memory so that it is adequate with respect to constructive memory. Martin and Deutscher were, in developing the causal theory, the reference is often made to the causal theory of memory. Relatively few papers developing the theory have so far been written. Compare the number of papers uh, devoted to developing the analysis, analogous causal theory of perception. I therefore rely heavily on Martin and Deutscher's 1966 paper, The Locus Classicus of the Causal Theory. So Martin and Deutscher were, in developing the causal theory, reacting to the deficiencies of the various empiricist theories of memory popular at the time. Empiricist theories differ in their details, but they have in common that they deny the need for a causal connection in the theory of memory. They deny that a causal connection between the initial representation and the later belief is necessary for genuine remembering to occur. Uh, we'll see exactly what that means in a moment. As Martin and Deutscher show, such theories are inadequate. And so here, they describe a counterexample with the following structure. A subject observes an event and forms a belief that such and such an event occurred. This belief is stored in her memory store. Later, the memory is lost due to damage to her brain. Now, after that, after having lost the memory, the subject is hypnotized. The hypnotist implants in her a belief that such and such an event occurred. And the implanted belief turns out to be indistinguishable from the original one. So an empiricist theory will imply that the subject remembers that the event occurred, but clearly she does not. So that is, I believe, the way the empiricist theories worked is something like, if you have an experience and later recover something that seems to be a memory that is accurate as a recollection of that experience, then that's what it is to remember the experience. And what Martin and Deutscher point out is that could happen because you store something, it gets lost, and then for an unrelated reason, you end up having a belief with that same content and believe that you remember it. But if you didn't actually have that con continuity all the way through, if it wasn't the original event that caused the trace that you later reconstruct, then Martin and Deutscher claim it's not really memory. So that's where the causal theory comes about, that they think the uh, the retrieval that you have at the end has to be caused by the original event through this sort of chain. The plausible suggestion made by Martin and Deutscher is that the empiricist theory delivers the wrong verdict about this case precisely because it does not include a causal condition. What is missing in the case is a causal chain connecting the initial observation to the subject's later representation. As Martin and Deutscher recognized, it is not enough simply to require that there be some causal connection or other between the observation and the representation. For many causal chains are simply not of the right sort, they are deviant. They describe a case with the following structure. A subject observes an event and forms a belief that such and such an event occurred. The belief is stored in her memory store. Later, the memory is lost due to damage to her brain. But in the meantime, the subject has told another about the event. After, so first you have the event, you tell someone about it, then you lose your memory. After you've lost your memory, the other person repeats her earlier description of the event back to her. Time goes by and the subject forgets having heard the repetition of the description. She now only believes that such and such an event occurred. In this case, a causal chain does connect the observation of the event to the subject's later representation. The problem is that the causal chain is not of the right sort. Now, footnote nine. A natural thought at this point in the development of the theory is that the causal chain is of the wrong sort in virtue of passing outside of the subject's body through the other person. While natural, the thought universalizes a contingent feature of human memory. So here they are, uh, uh, McKellian is objecting to uh, a thought about particular features of human memory being absolutely general. 
Martin and Deutscher point out that there could be creatures whose memories are stored in removable devices, devices which are clearly not part of their bodies. Imagine that you could slot in and out memory cards. If you could do that, those would still count as memories, provided that they go through the right sort of uh, causal process of going from your experience into the card, take the card out, hope that it doesn't get too damaged, put it back in, and then remember it. That would be fine. But if it took the card out, somehow it got erased, but then someone put something else back in, and then you remembered it, that would seem not quite like memory. And this sort of possibility is especially salient in these days of active externalism. And here he cites a paper by Clark and Chalmers, which is totally worth reading. It's called The Extended Mind. And uh, they argue that some of our mind actually already is outside our body. They, writing in the 1990s, use an example of a person who, with Alzheimer's disease who often helps navigate the world by consulting a notebook where they've stored some of their memories. But these days, just think about what happens if you ask a friend, hey, do you know so-and-so's phone number? They probably say, yeah, I know their phone number, and then pull up their phone and look up in their phone what the phone number is. They know it, but they know it in their phone. The phone is part of their memory. And so what Michaelian is saying is, we have to understand in order to really be memory, there has to be a proper connection between the original event and the recall, but that proper chain could go outside the body. But if it does, it has to do so in the right sort of way. And figuring out exactly what that right sort of way is, is probably difficult. But remembering an event, telling it to someone else, forgetting the event, being told the event, then forgetting you were told it and remembering it as a memory, that is not the right sort of way. The first, but not the only restriction on the class of admissible causal chains introduced by the causal theory is that in order for remembering to occur, the causal chain connecting the initial representation with a later representation must go via a memory trace. That is, whatever's going on in your head when you remember things, some bit of that has to happen in order for it to be a memory, as opposed to just something happening to you without you forming a memory trace and then someone telling you about it later on. That's not memory. The proposal to incorporate a reference to memory traces into the theory of memory has been surprisingly controversial. One standard objection presupposes that the theory of memory is a conceptual analysis. The core idea is that we should not build a story about memory traces into the theory of memory. For the theory would then imply that certain neuroscientific assumptions are built into our concept of remembering, which obviously they are not. That is, we had a concept of remembering long before we did any neuroscience. Humanity has always had a concept of remembering, and uh, whereas neuroscience is a recent development. So therefore, whatever remembering means, it shouldn't involve specific neuroscientific ideas. Such objections can perhaps be met, but I'm under no obligation to do so here. The new causal theory is not offered not as an analysis of the concept of memory, but rather as an account of memory itself. That is, he's not saying, what have we always meant by memory, but rather, what is the state that is memory? And this state, he believes, involves these causal traces. Though Martin and Deutsch's approach is largely a priori, they too are concerned to theorize memory itself rather than the concept of memory, as Sutton and Windhorst emphasize in their recent reappraisal of the paper. Though the causal theory of constructive memory is therefore unaffected by objections from adequacy conditions on conceptual analyses, that is ones that are dealing with, is this the concept we've always had? A superficially similar objection is relevant to the theory. Zamach argues that against building a reference to memory traces into the philosophical theory of memory on the ground that the theory of memory should not dictate to empirical science what it must discover about the workings of memory. The objection is puzzling, given that there has been no suggestion from empirical science that memory might function without memory traces. The objection is puzzling, that is, until we realize that Zamach doesn't count holographic traces as traces. Since Martin and Deutscher explicitly describe memory traces as structural analogs of experiences, 
the model here is the grooves of a record, their version of the causal theory runs the risk of dictating to empirical science. That is, if you think a memory trace has to be something that resembles the original event in some sort of way, that has to be work a particular way, then you are dictating things to the empirical science. But if you just say there must be some sort of trace, which could be some holographic trace, which is somehow stored in a distributed way throughout the brain, then maybe you're OK. Two responses to the objection are available. We might first point out that since there has been no suggestion from empirical science that memory might function without memory traces of some sort, it is safe for philosophical theorists of memory to build into their theories a claim that causation of rememberings goes via memory traces of some sort without specifying any further details. This might have been the better option when Zamach wrote in 1983. But our empirical understanding of memory has developed greatly since then, and we are now entitled to make a bolder move. There is overwhelming evidence from empirical investigations of memory that memory involves traces of precisely the holographic or distributed or superpositional sort mentioned by Zamach. We might therefore revise the causal theory so that it refers to memory traces described not as structural analogs, but rather as holographic. Such an approach, which I endorse, does not in any interesting sense dictate to empirical science what it must discover about the workings of memory. The revision precisely allows the philosophical theory of memory to learn from what empirical science has already discovered about the workings of memory. There remains a slight risk that empirical science will in the future arrive at results incompatible with the revised theory. But to point this out is just to say that empirical science might in the future arrive at results incompatible with its own present view of memory. I said earlier that it is still not sufficient to guarantee that a causal connection is appropriate to require that it goes via a memory trace. We call the second of Martin and Deutsch's cases described above. In this case, though the trace is destroyed by the time the false remembering occurs, the causation does initially go via this trace. Martin and Deutscher are aware of this problem, and they therefore add a requirement to the effect approximately that the memory trace must be causally active at the time of remembering, that it must contribute directly to the remembering. Their discussion of this requirement is somewhat obscure. It turns on a distinction, which I will not attempt to summarize here, between something's being operative in a circumstance and something's being operative for a circumstance. So don't worry about those details. But the basic idea is clear enough. The memory trace has to exist all along, and it has to be doing causal work at the time of the remembering. The addition of this requirement is a step in the right direction, but it is still not quite sufficient. As it stands, the theory remains vulnerable to the following sort of counterexample. A past experience of mine, E, produced a physical memory trace in my brain. I do not remember E at all, but owning an autocerebroscope, this is a fictional device that lets you look inside your own brain, I can inspect the anatomy of my brain. What I do then is read the said trace from time to time, much as I read the inscriptions in my diary. It is important not to be distracted by the fanciful details of the case. Zamak is onto something here, viz that there are multiple ways in which a trace might be doing causal work at the time of putative remembering. In order to avoid this sort of counterexample, we might simply add the requirement that the trace cause the representation in virtue of having been retrieved. But this specific requirement is rendered redundant by the next modification that I will propose. Consider a case in which a subject has a badly damaged episodic memory system. Normally, we have seen the episodic system is reliable. And remember, episodic memory is the memory for events that happen to you. Though it is constructive, its reliability is ensured by the properties of the constructive processes it employs, e.g. by the use of reliable heuristics and source monitoring. Suppose that the memory system has, in virtue of being damaged, become highly unreliable. Perhaps the heuristics used in source monitoring are wildly inappropriate, with the consequence that, Imagined scenes are often classified as experienced. Experienced scenes are often classified as dreamed, etc. The memory system might, despite its unreliability, retrieve an occasional accurate representation. 
e.g. an experienced scene might be represented as experienced. The classical causal theory implies that on those occasions the subject remembers, but clearly she does not. The case is not one of a subject with a malfunctioning system which happens occasionally to function properly. In such a case, the subject clearly manages occasionally to remember, but one of a subject with a permanently damaged system, which by chance occasionally produces an accurate representation. I propose that in order to avoid this sort of counterexample, an additional requirement be incorporated into the causal theory. The causal chain must go not only via a memory trace, but through a properly function that is a reliable memory system. The description of a memory system appropriate in this context is the most general description of the system that we can formulate. The proposal is, in short, that the classical causal theory of memory should be replaced with a causal reliableist theory of memory. I draw inspiration here from Pendlebury's causal reliableist theory of perception. So just to back up and say what happened in this paragraph, uh, Michaelian is saying, uh, it's not enough that you stored something via a memory system, it was preserved via that memory system, it was recovered via that memory system, and it was accurate. It matters that the system was functioning properly along the way. If your system is just totally damaged so that it's constantly doing things wrong, the fact that it occasionally got something that was accurate doesn't make it really remember. It's just like someone who's looking at a clock to tell time is only telling time if the clock is actually a working clock. If it's a stopped clock, then the person is not telling time by looking at it, even if they happen to look at it at a moment where the, it stopped at the time that it actually is. A second, more dramatic modification turns the causal reliableist theory into the new causal theory. The old theory is silent about the relations between the content of the original representation, that of the memory trace, and that of the eventually retrieved representation. But implicit in discussions of the theory is something like the following assumptions. First, the trace provides the full content of the later representation. Second, the initial representation provides the full content of the trace, even if some of the content available in the representation is not recorded by the trace. These conditions together rule out content generating construction and reconstruction. The problem is that content generation regularly occurs at various points along the path from initial representation to the representation eventually retrieved. The trace need not provide the full content of the representation for reconstructive processes involved in retrieval can generate new content. And the initial representation need not provide the full content of the trace for constructive processes involved in encoding and consolidation can generate new content. The implicit assumptions about the relations between the content of the initial representation, that of the memory trace, and that of the later representation are, in short, inadequate in light of the involvement of content generating constructive and reconstructive processes in memory. I write for simplicity as if there is only one initial representation and one trace. This is for convenience only. As emphasized above, in fact, construction in memory is often a matter of the integration of content from a variety of sources. My proposal is that we replace these assumptions with the following conditions. One, the content of the later representation does not go too far beyond that of the trace. Two, the content of the trace does not go too far beyond that of the initial representation. To see the point of these formulations, consider a case involving the phenomenon of boundary extension. We can easily describe analogous cases involving reconstruction. Someone might see part of a scene and encode a trace representing more of the scene than she saw. Later, she retrieves the trace and represents the larger scene. Does she remember the scene? The urge to answer that obviously she does not remember the scene, since after all, she did not see the whole of it, should be resisted. For to answer that way is to commit oneself to ruling out very many perfectly ordinary cases of remembering. So think about this. It's not just in funny psychological examples where people fill in additional details beyond what they actually saw. Almost always, this is what's going on in your own memory. So if you say, in order to be a good memory, in order to have knowledge on the basis of memory, you must not do any addition, 
any such rule would rule out almost all ordinary cases of memory. Therefore, this is the argument, a correct theory of memory must allow for this much reconstruction. And this is also not just a feature that is contingent because of how humans happen to work. This is probably going to be a feature that almost any creature with limited storage capacity in a complex world is going to figure out. They're going to reconstruct things in ways that regularly add things that weren't there originally. And that is part of what memory usually is. So therefore, a good theory of memory must allow for this much addition. Boundary extension is not the exception to the rule. It is the rule. For reasons of method, studies of constructive memory phenomena tend to focus on cases in which construction goes wrong, cases that is in which there was a, is a mismatch between the eventual representation and the initial experience. There is a danger that this will lead us to think that construction typically results in such, such mismatches. To think of construction as unreliable and hence of constructed memories as not being bona fide memories. But construction, we have seen, is a feature of many ordinary cases of remembering. Construction does not typically result in mismatches. Constructive memory is reliable. Thus, we need not and should not say that the subject does not genuinely remember the scene because she did not see the whole of it. We should instead say that she remembers the scene even though she did not see the whole of it. This will sound almost paradoxical, but only as long as we are in the grip of a naive picture of memory. Memory is no more a matter of passive transmission than perception is of passive reception. Epistemologists have already been able to some extent to reconcile themselves to thinking of perception as an active constructive source of knowledge. We now must get used to conceiving of memory as a similarly active and constructive source of knowledge. Given that content generation is compatible with remembering, why have I suggested that there are limits on how much content generation is compatible with remembering? The answer to this question has to do with the way in which the respective roles of perception, inference, and memory in the cognitive economy of a subject are to be distinguished. Perception is a belief independent process which generates content. Inference is a belief dependent process which generates content. Memory, I have argued, is a process which is sometimes belief independent and sometimes belief dependent and which generates content. There is thus a question about how to characterize the unique role played by memory in the subject's cognitive life. How can memory be distinguished at this level of abstraction from perception and inference? My proposal is that the distinction should be drawn in terms of the quantity of content typically generated by these belief producing processes. Perception generates, involves the generation of relatively little new content. The content of a perceptual belief normally does not go much beyond the content of the experience which leads to it. I'm not sure I totally agree here. Michaelian may be underestimating the amount to which perception is cognitively penetrated and affected by beliefs that we have. Inference. I refer here to full-blown inferences rather than the inference-like constructive processes involved in perception or memory. Inference can involve the generation of significant new content. That is, think about what Sherlock Holmes does. He takes a bunch of individual details that he knows and he infers something big and complex as a result of that. That's generating a lot of new content. The proposal is that memory is situated somewhere between these two extremes. Like inference, it can generate significant new content. Like perception, its generation of new content is subject to certain rigid constraints. Note that the proposal is not that the differences among the quantities of content generation by perception, memory, and inference provide a criterion by means of which to distinguish among these sources. I want here simply to understand how the sources differ with respect to the generation of content. And that's a good thing because I think, I suspect he's wrong about how much perception and memory differ. I, I, I expect that both of these processes involve substantial generation of content, though still far less than inference. And of course, the way you tell the difference between perception, memory, and inference is that perception is when it comes through your senses, memory is when it comes through your memory traces, and inference is when it comes through 
some sort of reasoning process by putting uh, that isn't through the uh, senses or through your memory traces. One might worry that the proposed similarity conditions are an ad hoc means of ensuring that memory is reliable despite being constructed. That is, the similarity conditions are the ones that say, you shouldn't add too much during reconstruction and you shouldn't add too much during encoding. But the worry is misdirected. We want the theory to account for the reliability of memory. And the new causal theory already builds in reliability by requiring causation via a reliable memory system. One might nevertheless worry that once we've taken on board the lesson that memory is thoroughly constructive, we should drop even the weakened similarity conditions proposed here. It would be interesting to explore the theory that would result from this modification. That is, if we didn't require that the thing that you recover is uh, very similar to the thing that went in and the thing that was stored, if you allow for all sorts of generation, as long as it's through a reliable process. It would be interesting to explore this theory, but I take it that the psychology of constructive memory does not force us to drop the similarity requirement entirely. It tells us that remembering generally involves much less similarity than we would intuitively suppose, but it does not suggest that a retrieved memory need, be, need not be at all similar to any representation encoded earlier. The proposed conditions on the adequacy of a trace are vague as they stand. I suspect that this vagueness is ineliminable. There is a difference between remembering and merely seeming to remember, but there is no reason to expect that we can draw the line with much precision. If a subject remembers something that is not the case, we know that she merely seems to remember. If she remembers something that is the case, and if little content generation occurs along the gener a relevant causal chain, we know that she genuinely remembers. If she remembers something that is the case, and if massive content generation occurs along the chain, we know that she merely seems to remember. We cannot say more than this. The following is my official formulation of the new causal theory. The causal theory of constructive memory. S, a subject, remembers P, a proposition, if and only if A, P is true. B, S represents P. And here represents could mean believes, thinks, imagines, whatever it is, but somehow that P is represented in the subject's head. C, there is a causal chain running back from S's current representation of P to an earlier representation of hers. D, the causal chain goes continuously via a dis perhaps distributed memory trace with the content P or something sufficiently close to P. E, the causal chain goes continuously via a reliable memory system responsible for the reconstruction of the trace and the current re representation. F, S's earlier representation had the content P or something sufficiently close to the content of her memory trace. And G, there is an appropriate relation between P itself and S's earlier representation, that P. A few remarks about the formulation. Clause A, the theory is a theory of factive memory. That is, in order for S to remember P, it must be that P is true. Clause B, a subject can have a representation with a given content without having a propositional attitude with the content. The theory thus covers, in addition to cases in which a belief is stored and retrieved, cases in which a subject stores a content without having formed a belief with the content, and cases in which a subject retrieves a content without forming a belief in the content and to think about what it is to uh, store content without having formed a belief. Just think about you just look out and then you see something and then you go away. And then someone asks, did you see a person wearing a blue shirt? And you might be able to recover the scene and now recognize that there is a blue shirt in it. And you might not have believed that there was a person with a blue shirt in it at the beginning, but now you do. And it's because of this trace. Uh, clause G, various relations are appropriate in the relevant sense. The subject might perceive P, infer P, et cetera. That is, if you want to remember that P, it matters that you have known that P, but you could have known it in various ways. The notion of appropriateness at work here is intended to be a generalization of the notion of reliability to cover not only belief producing processes, but also representation producing processes in general. So if something 
created an image in your head that wasn't exactly a belief. Hard to say exactly what an image is or a belief is, but it just has to create it in an appropriate way. Finally, the theory is not a theory of knowing from memory. S might remember P and yet not know P. This will happen if she has a defeater for her belief P. So for instance, someone who has an experience and recalls that experience accurately later, but has been told that she was under the influence of psychedelic drugs at the time, that person may not know that this was real. They may think that it was just a memory that was fake, and so therefore they won't know the content, but they'll still have the real memory. Lest it be thought that the new causal theory departs only in insignificant ways from the classical causal theory, of which it is indeed a recognizable descendant, I pause to emphasize its novel features. In order to accommodate the constructive nature of memory, the new causal theory incorporates a very relaxed similarity requirement. In order to explain how memory can be reliable despite this relaxed requirement, it incorporates a reference to properly functioning memory systems. These two modifications produce a theory which, unlike the classical causal theory, is consistent with the empirical psychology of memory. And unlike the classical theory, the new theory has counterintuitive implications. Unlike the classical causal theory, e.g., it permits that one can successfully remember more than what one learned. The new causal theory thus goes significantly beyond the classical causal theory. So that is, you can see some scene incompletely store it in a way that fills in extra details. And if you restore those and remember those details, and if those details were accurate, then it's going to count as remembering those details, even though you didn't see them initially. That's sort of surprising. The new causal theory also differs from existing accounts of generative memory. Though Sutton's discussion of the reconstructive character of memory informs my approach here, his focus is on the nature of memory traces. He thus does not aim to develop the sort of general account of memory at issue in the debates over the causal and empiricist theories of memory. While he maintains that semantic or factual memory is purely preservative, Dokic argues that episodic memory is not. His focus, however, is on a very specific kind of generation. In order to account for the fact that episodic memory provides the subject with a re reason to believe that the information carried by it comes directly from the subject's own past life, Unlike factual memory, which only provides the subject with a reason to believe that an event happened, Dokic proposes an account of episodic memory on which the fact that it comes directly from the subject's own experience is presented in the nature, in the memory experience itself. While this is an account of episodic memory as generative of a specific sort of content, it does not cover the sort of generative transformation of content on which I focused in section one and which are covered by the new causal theory. The new causal theory covers the sort of generation on which Dokic focuses. See the discussion of source monitoring above. So that is, he's saying, Dokic has noted that you need to explain how it is that you can remember your memory includes information such as that this was my experience, even though at the time my perceptual experience may not include that information. But Michaelian wants to say, we're allowed to actually incorporate a lot more information too. The new causal theory also differs from Bernecker's theory on which only certain limited sorts of transformation of content are compatible with remembering. Bernecker's theory permits that remembering is compatible with transformations that merely keep information current, e.g. tense updating. That is, today I see that the sun is shining, tomorrow my memory will be trans transformed into the form that the sun was shining. That is a change in content. It goes from present tense to past tense. But Michaelian's point is that's only a tiny change in content. And our memory actually usually introduces a lot more than just that. Uh, Bernecker also allows transformations that reduce content, e.g. existential generalization. That is, I go from this table is in the room to there is a table in the room. But it explicitly forbids transformations which generate additional supplemental content. While on Bernecker's theory, memory is perhaps generative in a weak sense, according to him, the content produced as output by memory need not be literally the same as that it took as input. His account of construction 
unlike that incorporated into the new causal theory, does not cover transformations in which information not present in the input is incorporated into memory. Thus, his theory is empirically inadequate as it misclassifies cases of genuine but supplemental memory of the sort discussed in section one as cases of merely apparent memory. Finally, the new causal theory differs from Mathen's recent account, which does not deal with the nature of the causal connection required for remembering, the question of how much generation of content is compatible with remembering, or the problem of how the reliability of memory is ensured despite its constructive character. Mathen's focus is rather epistemological. How can memory justify a belief given that it does not simply preserve content? The content here is Burge's uh, the context here is Burge's discussion of the acceptance principle, according to which a person is entitled to accept as true something that is presented as true, including by memory, and is intelligible to him, unless there are stronger reasons not to. Burge's defense of the principle assumes that there is a purely preservative form of memory. But as Mathen argues, in the course of dealing with this question, that, that what is preserved in memory is a trace from which it is possible to reconstruct an image or belief. And as his discussion makes clear that he acknowledges that the trace can differ from the experience from which it stems, his account is compatible with the new causal theory. Section three, epistemological implications of the new causal theory. The default view about memorial justification is that memory is capable of preserving, but not of generating justification. Uh, Jennifer Lackey cites Audi, Dummett, Owens, and Plantinga as endorsing some form of preservationism about memorial justification. Lackey has recently challenged this preservationist view, arguing for a moderate form of generationism. She does not use the term, a view according to which memory can generate justification by generating a new belief with a previously stored content. The gist of the argument is the following. When a subject initially acquires some information, it can be stored in her memory without her first forming a belief having it as its content. Later retrieval of the resulting record can result in the formation of such a belief. Assuming that the relevant cognitive processes are sufficiently reliable, that belief will be justified. In addition to this argument, she gives arguments for generationism which start from the fact that a subject's relation to defeaters beliefs that the subject has or beliefs that she ought to have for a belief can change over time while the belief is preserved in memory. As these arguments are thoroughly discussed by Lackey and Signor, I will not take them up here. Moderate generationism already departs significantly from the default preservationist view. But if the arguments of section one and two above is right, we should, at least given one standard theory of epistemic justification, endorse a more radical form of generationism a view according to which memory can generate justification, both by generating a new belief with a previously stored content and by generating a new belief along with its very content. Moderate generationism and radical generationism are discussed in my PhD thesis on memory and testimony. They should not be confused with the different positions in the debate around preservationism, recently labeled moderate generativism and radical generativism by Bernacker. Okay, that's a bit confusing, but Michaelian saying that uh, some people say, some people accept that memory can generate justification for new beliefs that you never had before, but only because something bypassed your belief system entirely and went into the memory trace. He's saying memory can ju generate justification for beliefs that you never had and that were never even there in the first place at all, because memory is constantly adding bits and pieces to the things that it's stored and those bits and pieces you are generally justified in believing, even if they turn out not to have been there originally. According to reliabilism about epistemic justification, uh, a belief is justified just in case it is produced by a reliable process. That is a process that tends to generate mostly true beliefs. Given this theory of justification, radical generationism follows directly from the new causal theory of memory. The new causal theory permits that memory is sometimes a simple belief dependent process, a process that takes a belief as input and delivers the same belief as output. In such cases, it can only be conditionally reliable and so can confer no justification on the belief that it produces. 
In these cases, memory only preserves justification. According to moderate generationism, memory can generate justification by generating a new belief with a previously stored content. The new causal theory permits that memory can generate a new belief with a previously stored content. When it does so, it functions as a belief independent process. Since the theory says that memory functions reliably in these cases, it implies, together with reliabilism, that memory then generates justification. According to radical generationism, memory can generate justification by generating a new content along with a belief with that content. The new causal theory permits that memory can generate a new content along with a belief that content. When it does so, it functions either as a belief independent process or as a belief dependent process with some non-doxastic inputs. That is whatever was going on in your experience or in the memory traces. Since the theory says that memory functions reliably in these cases, it implies, together with reliabilism, that memory then generates justification. Cases of the former sort are straightforward. In cases of the latter sort, since the process has some non-doxastic starting points, at least some of the justification for the belief that it produces might have been generated by the process itself, rather than simply inherited from the doxastic starting point of the process. Note that the argument for radical generationism does not depend on this claim about the capacity of mixed processes to generate justification. If the causal theory of constructive memory is right, content generation sometimes occurs in the context of a mixed process, but sometimes also occurs in the context of a belief independent process. The claim thus matters only for determining how frequently the generation of justification occurs via content generation. Epistemologists often assume that the epistemology of memory is relatively straightforward, at least as far as the question of justification is concerned. Since they assume that memory only preserves beliefs, they conclude that memory can only preserve justification. The thought is that it is a straightforward matter to work out the epistemology of memory given the, current, the correct theory of memory. Those who make this assumption are half right and half wrong. It is indeed a relatively straightforward matter to work out the epistemology of memory once the correct theory of memory is in hand. It is just that epistemologists have so far typically relied on a natural but inadequate theory of memory. With an empirically adequate theory of memory as constructive in hand, memory appears as clearly generative of beliefs and therefore of justification. Okay, so the overall point is he's demonstrated some features of how memory works. And he says, here's a new theory of memory that allows for those sorts of features. He's argued that these features are not merely contingent features of how human brains happen to work, but that we should expect them in any sort of cognitively limited creatures in complex environments like ours. That is, often what's going to happen is that what's stored is not precisely what went in and what is retrieved is not precisely either what was stored or what went in. Nevertheless, this process is usually reliable and can generate justification for whatever it produces. Since what it produces is often new, that means it often justifies beliefs that you never had before. You can be justified in believing something on the basis of memory, even if you never believed that thing before. And he argues that if we don't accept all these features as part of a theory of memory or part of a theory of justification, then we're going to end up saying that most of what we humans actually do isn't really memory or isn't really justified. Some people might embrace that sort of skeptical conclusion, but Michaelian wants to instead say, let's analyze that, understand how it works, understand what makes it reliable and when it is reliable and say that it's justified and memory when it works in something like the normal way. And we have to think about exactly how these traces have to work. But a lot of that can be done partly by cognitive scientists. And some of it can be done in abstract by philosophers just thinking about what would have to go on for a creature to have memory.